everyone. Welcome back again to One Soccer Happy Hour. Annie Petrillo alongside Carmelina Moscato, Laura Armstrong, and today's special guest is national team member, uh, Manchester City player, Olympic bronze medalist, Janine Becky. How you doing, Janine? I'm good. How are you guys? We are fantastic. We are fantastic. Um, in this day and age of uh, quarantining, we'd like to know, where are you self-isolating? How are you keeping yourself entertained? I am in Colorado with my family and I'm here with my mom and my sister. So I normally live alone. So just the pure fact having two other people around me keeps me uh, quite mentally intact with being around <laughs> other people because I don't usually have to do that. Um, but no, it's been really great to, to be around some family, some unexpected family time. Yes. Well, before we get into uh, the nitty gritty of the national team and your experiences and everything, the most recent news is you just signed a new two-year deal with Manchester City. First of all, congratulations. And Thank you. what does that mean to you to, to get that deal and be able to stay there for another few years? Um, it's obviously quite a big deal to me. Um, when I first went over there two years ago, I, I thought that I would only be there for a year. That was kind of what I was set on. I really was hesitant to move away from home or what was close to home. Um, but the first year was, it was a challenge for me. I, I didn't get a ton of playing time. I was adjusting to living in a new country. And then this season has kind of been a whole different story for me. I've, I'm adjusted to living in England. I have some really good friends. So it's kind of felt more like home to me and more like somewhere that I actually live, which has made it a lot easier for me. Um, and the last two contracts I've been on have only been one year deals. So it's kind of unsettling to not know where I'm going to be that next year. So it was a big deal for me to sign a two year deal and know um, that I'm where I'm going to be for the next two years and have that solidified. And especially in this time when there's so many unknowns and um, yeah. that's the big stress, it was definitely a big relief. And I'm very thankful that uh, the club has committed to me for two years. And I'm really excited to continue my um, journey with city. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, Janine. And obviously you've earned it like every step of the way. You bring to light a lot of uh, interesting points about players overseas, what it takes to feel comfortable and to, you know, it's it's not just about the on pitch, but that's what everybody sees and comments on, right? It's, it's all about how those personal relationships you build and, uh, you know, the way that you said it feels like home and you almost become an expert at building a home wherever the heck you end up. So uh, congrats on knowing that. It is such a relief and uh, you, you've earned every single... Uh, piece of that so it's been really cool to watch your journey thank you appreciate it what is it like you share facilities as well with the men's pro team right like what is that professional experience like playing uh, soccer for a woman overseas yeah um we have just like first class facilities world class um training facilities gyms pitches everything is just like top of the line at city so um, the way that they have it set up is if you haven't watched the Amazon prime documentary about, um, Manchester city, it's one of the all or nothings. Mm -hmm. I'm in it. What? In it. Yeah. No. Anyways, it's a side story, but please, this is about you. It's not about me, but That's I'm amazing. Well, clearly you've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in, I'm in a, I'm in a crowd shot. Cause I saw a game, uh, at crystal palace when they took on man city and it was when Manchester was on like a 14 game unbeaten streak and Crystal Palace got awarded a PK in the final minutes of the game. We were behind the net, my husband and I. Oh my gosh, and that's said, incredible. It. Manchester City's uh, unbeaten streak is coming to an end. Goalkeeper makes this incredible save. Oh, um, you need spoiler <laughs> Well, this was like, <laughs> but uh, anyways, watching the documentary, there I am, and there's my husband. I was a little hungover, so I'm just like this. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was like, yeah, man. I That's amazing. It. Well, for all of you that haven't seen it, one, <laughs> note that you're going to see her in the stands. But two, it's it's an incredible documentary. They do such an amazing job. But it, um, you see a lot of the facility. And part of the way that it's designed is the main building is a circle. And uh, there's a pitch on the inside of the building, which is the first team match day minus one pitch. I know having to feel just for match day minus one. Wow. Why doesn't everyone have that? I don't know. <laughs> um, but that's the way that it's designed. So we're actually on one side of the building with the academy and then they're on the other side of the building as the first team, um, which 
obviously as a, as a first team player on the women's side, it would be really cool to be on the same side as the men's first team, but that's the way that they've had it set up for years. Um, even before, before the women's team like kind of came back. So, but we have access to everything that they have access to the, the sides of the building are kind of mirrored. So we all have the same stuff other than some small differences, but like we have access to their physios when we need them. Like if we, need access to their MRI or their cryotherapy chamber. They're very, um, you know, it's, it's words I never thought I would use. Um, they're very accommodating to us. So it's really great to be part of a club with such a world renowned men's team. And it's also really exciting because I had never really had a premier league team that I followed. I just loved to watch the premier league, but now I can say that I'm a city fan and they've made it pretty easy to be a fan over the last couple of years. So um, it's definitely a good club to be a part of uh, a dream club really for any footballer, I would imagine. Um, so I'm really excited that I get to continue to take advantage of being part of that. And then um, yeah, just, just football in England is just a whole nother world. Uh, it's literally life or death for some people over there. Uh, and you don't really understand that until you're actually like really in it. Um, and you understand the passion that some people have for their team and the deep, deep hatred that they have for the other teams. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> shocking. Um, but it's really cool and definitely a dream as a footballer to be engulfed into that kind of culture. Um, and then you come out of it and you're like, whoa, <laughs> it's a whole other world. But uh, yeah, it's been, it's been amazing. Janine, when uh, Man City announced your signing um, the other day, Gavin, I'm going to butcher this name, Matt Kell? Mm -hmm. the head of women's football, he started his sort of quote about your signing by saying she represents everything that we're about. What does that mean to you as a player? Like this is Manchester city uh, that we're talking about. We're not talking about just like that club down the street. <laughs> and they're saying that you represent everything that, that we're about. What's it like to hear that? It's obviously a huge honor, especially to hear that from, you know, one of the top people in management. Um, and Gavin works incredibly hard to put together type of team that wins championships but what I also really appreciate about being at City and this is a big part of the reason that I wanted to re-sign is that they're super interested in having a good group of people um, and I think that just makes it so much more enjoyable to be part of that you know these are the people that you see every day um, sometimes way more than you want to um, <laughs> but it's kind of similar to the national team where we had just have this and Carm can speak to this just this amazing culture and amazing group of people that just make you want to be there and that's, that's what I feel when I'm there. So to hear him say that is obviously a huge honor. And um, it just kind of reaffirms all the reasons why, why I want to be there and to continue to get better. And for him to recognize that he thinks that I've grown over the last two seasons is also, um, you know, a humbling thing to hear because he has seen the top of the women's game for a long time and has seen a lot of world-class players in the environment currently and that have come through. Um, so yeah, it, it, his words definitely um, hit me deep and I appreciated those and I'm looking forward to continuing, um, you know, maybe more than two years, but hopefully two years or for sure two years for now. Well, you actually started your pro career though, Janina, NWSL. You were there for a couple of years before being loaned out to Man City and of course getting this great extension. How would you describe, while the NWSL is definitely growing and you can make the argument that women's soccer around the world is still growing, what would be the comparisons for you, maybe some of the similarities or differences between those two leagues? Yeah, I think this is the top question that I've gotten since I've played <laughs> in both leagues. Uh, so I've gotten pretty good at answering it, I like to think. Um, the way that I compare the two leagues is I see the NWSL as a league that takes full advantage of the, my Siri just came on my, that was weird. Um, <laughs> technology is sometimes my friend. Um, that new cell is, is a league that takes full advantage of the athleticism of their players. And it's, um, I think there's a big difference in how some teams approach the game. Uh, so take a team like Portland, who has uh, players that enjoy possession, enjoy playing smaller passes, um, and but still have the ability to counterattack because they have those athletic players um, and then hard to find an example in the moment but a team that maybe sits in and plays more on the counter uh, but the difference in 
from team to team, I think is a lot more, is seen a lot more in the NWSL, whereas in the WSL, what I've really appreciated is that from top to the bottom of the league, everyone tries to play. There's not a team that we come up against a lot that just shells the ball down the field and tries to catch us in a mistake. It's like the bottom team in the league's trying to play out. They're trying to build up against the press. They're pressing us. They're putting us under pressure. So I've really appreciated that. And I think that is um, just obviously more of a tendency of European teams, like teams in Spain, in France, things like that. Um, but I also think that we're starting to see more of that in the NWSL. And that will make, that's what makes me so excited, uh, mm -hmm. especially with, more European players coming to the league um, and getting some more European coaches over to the league as well. Cause obviously that playing style starts with the coach. So I find that that's a bit more of a tendency in the WSL is to have those coaches that prefer um, to focus more on the technical and tactical side of the game. Whereas in uh, the NWSL, I think that it varies a little bit more. And so, how, so when you look at your own sort of growth and development from NWSL, you've already identified it. So it was such a great, you know, experience to go into a European league with uh, different styles of play and identity. So how, how have you grown as an individual player? Like, how would you sort of compare how they've managed you particularly, <clears throat> right, personally? Yeah, I think that um, I didn't have a whole lot of success in the NWSL. I found um, my first three years as a pro were really difficult. Uh, I kind of came into a dash team my rookie season as a Canadian allocated player and um to be honest I think kind of just got playing time because I was one of the more internationally experienced players on the team and I would say I probably didn't perform well enough to be one of the players that that got playing time and it bode, boded well for me um in that moment just because of the team that we had and then the second year in Houston, you know, I was a, I was not a consistent starter. I really struggled to get consistent big game time. Um, and we had a, we had two really frustrating seasons in Houston. And there was a lot of lessons that I learned um, from, from those seasons. And then obviously I went to a sky blue team who really struggled in the year that I was there. Um, and again, I saw a curve in playing time. I just couldn't really like find my rhythm. It was uh, difficult for me. So I kind of felt like there was a lot of unfinished business in the end of all when I left, but I figure, you know, I'm young. I want to go have this experience overseas while I can. And then, you know, when I want to start settling down, um, I can come back and be a little bit closer to home. But when I got to city and I started training and our training sessions are just filled with uh, technical work and passing and possession in the tiny, tiny area. And um, it was just like, stuff that I hadn't not done before. It wasn't new to me, but yeah. the level that it was executed at on a consistent basis across the whole team, I was incredibly impressed by. And you could tell that these players were just used to doing this. It was just like second nature to them. Um, you know, setting a ball back hard on the ground instead of, you know, laying it off for someone to, to come play. And it's just a different style of training than what I was used to. Uh, and so I really had to, focus on getting better technically, which is just, it kind of came to us as a surprise to me because on the teams that I've been on, I have been more, one of the more technical players, um, especially in a league like the NWSL, just purely because of international experience and things like that. Um, but that's what I really struggled with my first year. And the coach at the time, Nick Cushing, when I got there, you know, he made it really clear if you, if you can't perform in training and you can't be technically consistent, you don't get on the field. And he definitely stuck to that. And then this season, um, obviously coming off the World Cup, uh, it was an interesting segue into mm -hmm. a new season. But I really put that emphasis on, you know, how can I get better technically going into this season? And I had a good preseason and was a lot sharper. And my technical ability has just gone up so much. And it's just more of like a muscle memory thing. And being around players that test your technical ability all the time and yes. you stand out like a sore thumb if you <laughs> are playing you know a bouncing ball or you know someone will tell you that's not good enough exactly. um, and that was the shift in my game that I think has been so evident to to me and to the national team when we've been in since since the world cup um, and it's exciting because I 
you know, the later you get in your career, and that sounds funny for me to say at 25. <laughs> I was going to say, not yet. Uh, <laughs> Take it easy yeah. over there. <laughs> it's, it's not these big, huge steps that you're taking. It's these small percents that um, help you, you know, become a better player. And I've seen those small percents in my technical game over the last two years. And hopefully those percents keep building. Janine, we're going to get back to your national team stuff in a little bit here. But before we leave the, the talk of England, who do you think, this is a question <laughs> from YouTube, who do you think is the next women's national team player that we're going to see overseas? Ooh. If you were going to pick. Mm. Your crystal on ball the, out. On the current national team? On the current national team. Ooh, that's a hard question. Um, <laughs> There's quite a few already, right? Like Kadisha and Heidema. <laughs> And I think it'll be uh, Jesse Fleming. Yeah, that makes sense. Out of school, right? Mm -hmm, for yep. Sure. She's, uh, yeah, making some big decisions. And I really, I'm not even keeping anything secret. I literally have no idea what she's going to do. But just knowing her and knowing her aspirations and how much she loves the game, I can definitely mm -hmm. see her being in Europe. When you mentioned earlier that you have people asking you about the difference between NWSL and, and uh, UWCL, do you have other players asking you what it's like to be playing overseas? Yeah, I think more of the questions have come from my teammates in England. Like, um, oh, interesting. what is the league like? Because uh, they don't have the best view of the NWSL right. and I think it probably comes from a little animosity that the women's national team is <laughs> so successful if I'm honest and I mean it's fair yeah. um but also I think some of them have seen some games and it's just such a different game that mm -hmm. it's just what they're, they're it's not what they're used to so mm -hmm. it's foreign and then it's like well I don't know if I would enjoy that and, and to be fair I don't think the NWSL is a place for everyone Mm -hmm. um, but I think having the experience now in both leagues, it's so beneficial to get the experience of a different league. And for a lot of the players that I play with, I think that they would benefit a lot from just the like raw speed of mm -hmm. play mm -hmm. in terms of the actual speed of players, not even the, the how fast the ball moves, but how fast the people move. <laughs> um, and obviously the the girls that play for England have had a good taste of that playing against top teams in the world but um for some other girls I think would definitely benefit from from having that experience interesting before we get into some fun rapid fire questions we have a, th a couple of them throughout the show I do just want to quickly ask because part of also growing the women's game or talking about the women's game and talking about these different leagues is exposure and coverage mm -hmm. um and a couple of the other team members of yours who we've had on who play in the NWSL, we have asked them about the new deal they signed with CBS. I mean, it's a pretty big deal to have some of those yeah. games actually there on a digital platform and have that kind of exposure. Um, so I, I don't know if things have already changed in the few years that you've still been playing in Europe, but how would you say the coverage has been for the women's game in Europe can, can compare to what it gets in North America? Yeah, I think um, I th um, before last year, I would have said there's a much bigger commitment to getting the women's game on TV in the U.S. Sorry, there was a motorcycle. Um, <laughs> and with, like, the lifetime deal, yeah. I think I was a little bit confused by that because I'm like, here's this channel that has all these, like, really sappy movies <laughs> and not a channel that very many people pay attention to. So I think it was a... a good deal for both the player the league and the, the channel because it got obviously more viewers to the channel hopefully um and then last season when they were able to get stuff on ESPN I was like that is that's where it needs to go mm -hmm. um because you're a normal person sitting on the couch they're not thinking I'm going to go to Lifetime to watch a women's soccer game like okay. you need to go to ESPN Fox Sports 1 like whatever sports channels you have that should be where where things are shown. So I think in that regard, there's still some way to go, but CBS is a massive deal. Um, there's loads of sports that are shown on CBS. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think in Europe, when I first joined the team, uh, the games were available online in some mm -hmm. respects, but there's a lot of games that aren't, like there's just absolutely no way to watch mm -hmm. them. Um, and then this past season, they launched the FA Player, which has been a fantastic platform for the league. 
uh, and it's internationally used, which is great. So my mom can watch it here for free. Um, and that's been fantastic. The only other thing that I would say about that is there's a, like some continental cup games, like league cup games are not shown on it. So there's definitely tweaks that need to be uh, figured out, but there's at least one game a week that's shown on BT sport or BBC sport um, in England, which is great. And being one of the top teams in the league, that's us a lot, which is really cool. Uh, but I think that there's still is a massive step to be taken. Um, obviously, it's tough to compete on the weekends with the Premier League mm -hmm. because that's, you know, BT Sport. We play mm -hmm. almost at the exact same time. Um, we play majority of our games on Sundays. So since the Premier League is split between Saturdays and Sundays, sometimes we get those time slots, but it's difficult to compete with them. So I think that's, that's something that's always going to be there. That's an issue yeah. that's hard to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, I'm honestly not super bothered by that. Uh, but the other big step that was taken in the WSL was um, that Barclays bought the league. So um, that was just a massive, massive yes. deal for the women's game in England. Um, mm -hmm. So that's been really cool. And that they player was a big deal. So hopefully over the next few years, uh, we continue to see our games more widely televised. Awesome. Love it. All right. We're going to have a little bit of fun here and I'm going to take the opportunity to switch my camera because the sun <laughs> wow. is blowing out my face. That's so. quite nice. I think it's Natural good light. light. Do you think if I move it Beautiful. really check out these shadows? Not working for me. It's stealing my <laughs> shadow. Do you oh, guys have one of those like ring lights? You like kind of do. Camera. I'm sorry. What did, you just, what did you just ask? Hey, there it is. <laughs> Karma has stadium lights. I know, it's just stadium lights. I was trying to be professional, and then, yeah, the sun ruined it. Uh, happy Earth Day, everybody. <laughs> happy Earth Day. Happy yes, Earth Day. so uh, I'm going to start this off. I'll ask the first one. Karm, you'll ask the second one. No problem. And uh, then, Laura, you'll ask the third one, and I'll finish off the fourth one. I'm nervous. Okay. So no, this is no, listen. You can either <laughs> you can answer quickly, or you can feel free to offer up an explanation as well. So number okay. one, the best player you've played with. Mm. Why you gotta give me the hard one first? Heavy hitter. <sighs> Such a hard question. <laughs> I feel like there's multiple answers. You know, my gut tells me Christine Sinclair, obviously the goat, the best of all time, <laughs> if you will the greatest of all time. Um, that would be the answer from the heart because obviously I get to see her tweak her craft almost every day when we're together, which is insane. She's a freak. Um, so yeah, let's just go with that. That's who needs more explanation than that. No Jelly one's going to be mad at you on. for that. Mic drop. Okay. Yeah, you got, you got the right audience for that answer. Okay. Number two. <laughs> That's true. Perfect. We're all with you. The uh, number two, the toughest defender in the game currently. Okay. Um, again, <laughs> another toughie. You can stray away from the Canadian. Yeah, and I'm, I'm straying away from that. We know what the answer would be in that <laughs> case. Uh, <laughs> Carm. Just kidding. <laughs> She's still playing. I wouldn't even uh, accept it. It's wrong. <laughs> gosh, this is difficult. Um, I would say Lucy Bronze is probably up there. Beauty. Um, Steph Houghton's an incredible defender. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wendy Renard. I mean, there's just oh, such a long list of current players that are super hard to beat. But Steph's obviously a good one because I get to to train against her every day. So she's yeah. she's great. That's a great answer, by the way. All right, Laura, on to you. Uh, who is your funniest women's national team teammate? Current environment, I guess. <laughs> Different types of humor, but... <laughs> Definitely, like, when it comes to things completely unexpected, Alicia Chapman. I've heard that. I've heard that Obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we have a really funny team. They, ever, they all make me laugh. Deanne Rose is really funny just because she's just completely herself, and she's <laughs> just her, her mannerisms and her personality are just so funny to me. Mm -hmm. Um. I feel like I'm forgetting a very, very obvious one. Mm -hmm. And I'm, it's not going to come to me in the moment. We have like 40 more minutes. You can it's circle back. Yeah. Think yeah. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to think yeah. about it. But I mean, Alicia Chapman obviously is the first to come to mind. 
I always, yeah, I've heard from a lot of people that she's pretty funny. And then she just put out that video. Um, it, she's definitely on somebody's shoulders. Those are not her legs. Although she's got some strong legs, but yeah, whatever she's doing, it was entertaining. So here's the thing in yeah. the climate of quarantine, who would be a teammate you most definitely, let's keep it to the national team. Maybe a lot of people would know those names a little bit better. You could definitely not quarantine with. Okay. I Whether it's just, watching this. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and it could be for whatever reasons. And then maybe somebody you would definitely get along with and, and be able I mean, to survive two months. I think that some people would answer the first question with me. Oh. So um, <laughs> same thing. Don't worry about it. The second person who I definitely could hit be with is Jesse Fleming. We're tournament roomies, so we're used to being in close quarters nice. for long periods of time so we've kind of just figured it out figured out each other's mojos i know when to not speak to her and i know when i can um annoy her which is good that's the key um <laughs> who could i not want probably one of the youngsters just because <laughs> like jordan or julia one of those two yeah. just they're just always doing tiktok dances yeah young people are annoying <laughs> young ones ew no i'm just kidding they're great i love them um but that's gonna be my bailout answer because i can't really think about it well i will say this because we did have steph LeBay on um she said that she was most likely to go the longest in her household without a shower so you might want to think about that yeah <laughs> hey don't tell your secrets to andy petrillo <laughs> to start checking in on her make sure she's showering <laughs> at the text georgia i mean she's living she's with her girlfriend how do you yeah. not shower well but, that's what they said out of the two of them we're yeah. like who would go the longest without a shower and it was steph i mean so I, I i believe it but i feel like we also have a pretty hygienic team again i feel like there's not that many people that i would really hate to be stuck with it's that's a very i mean we have a very good team in that regard we we don't hate spending a lot of time together which is not common that is a good thing to hear. Oh, yeah. um, so we're, we're going to get back to some fun questions, but let's um, let's kind of, of hit the serious topics here a little bit. And the World Cup that just happened, and obviously it was disappointment for the Canadian squad. But I think, you know, I can tell, I can tell you right now that for me and a lot of people, I know you endears yourself to so many people when you stepped up and spoke after the round of 16 exit and, of course, the, the penalty kick. How did you deal with that moment? How did you deal with negativity, positivity, and grow from it? Yeah, um, it's, it's easier for me to talk about now um, because, I mean, in some regards, it feels like it was just so recent. And in other regards, it feels like that was so long ago. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that I've kind of explained it is I almost feel like it was kind of an out of body experience after the game, because it was just like so many things going on. It felt like we were on the field after the game forever. And it was like one of those things feelings as an athlete, you're like, when do we like leave the field? When is it time? When is it enough that we've like felt this and it's just time to go, you know, get out of here. Um, yeah, but it was an interesting moment because I was standing there just talking. I don't know if we were talking. We might have just been standing there with Desiree Scott and um, our media officer at the time had come up and just said, hey, like, can one of you, obviously, I know that this isn't the right time, but can one of you do this interview? And we kind of looked at each other and I knew she was like, I don't want her to do it. And I was like, I don't want you to have to do it because obviously she's like a veteran on the team. I knew she was absolutely devastated. And so that's just like, that's Desi. She's like, I'll do it. And I was like, no, it's fine. I'll do it. Um, and I'm, I'm a really, my faith is really important to me. And I think that kind of took over for me in that moment. And I just felt, you know, like this is something that I need to do. And, um, looking back on it, it's just like, those moments are so much bigger than, than how I was feeling in that moment. And it was this heaviness of, you know, I just, you feel like I just lost the game for the team. Mm -hmm. um and obviously that's not the case there was 90 minutes where we didn't score like it's exactly. it's it is what it is um but like in that moment that was the feeling um and so maybe it was me thinking I just need to to say this so people know that that's how I feel which looking back on it now I, I don't really know what motivated me to do the interview but I did it and um obviously 
what transpired was quite a special moment between me, me and Sink and um, kind of the passing of the torch from her to, to a younger player. And um, that's something that I'll cherish for the rest of my life is that she trusted me enough in that moment to say that you can do this. And uh, the first thing she said to me after the game was, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that to you. I shouldn't have put you in that position. Like that was my responsibility. And of course, I don't agree with that. Like that's not on her. Um, and I think that that's my biggest, what still makes my blood boil um, now is that people blame her for not taking the PK. And that's not right because it's not on her. She's the captain, but that's, that's not your responsibility as a captain to constantly put the team on your back like that. Um, but yeah, what came out in the interview, I think was partially me talking and partially just what was supposed to come out. And I'm so thankful for that moment. And I had absolutely no idea that I was going to blow up like it did. Uh, but that's just what's so special to me is the power of sport and the power of words in moments that are such a devastation to, to you and the team. But, um, that, you know, hopefully from what I saw that, that my words inspired a lot of people and, um, yeah, it was a special moment and it's something that, that I'll always remember. And, uh, yeah, when it comes to like the negativity and positivity thing, that was the first time in my career that I've really experienced true, like scrutiny, um, personally, like directly at me. Um, I had a lot of, here's the thing. You either choose to look at it or you choose not to look at it. And I chose to look at it. So that was my fault. Um, it's difficult to <laughs> avoid those things in that time. And, you know, in this day and age, as athletes, getting on our phone is the first thing that we do after games. Sadly, I wish that wasn't the case, but, but it is, if we're being honest. And uh, I will say, though, for every negative comment, there was probably six or seven positive ones. And that really pulled me through. But that first 24 hours after that moment was was hard. And I would not have picked a different group of people ever to be around in a moment like that. Mm -hmm. um, the team just has a really special way of coming together in really crappy moments. Um, but yeah, some of the things that you read are just, they're really hard to, to manage your emotions about. Mm -hmm. um, people get really personal and um, so really blamey and really aggressive. And I'm like, oh, that's so unnecessary. Um, <laughs> oh. But I'm thankful that I have, you know, the, um, the family that I do and the background that I do and that I was raised in a way that I don't need the affirmation from strangers behind a computer screen to tell me that, you know, I was brave in that moment and, and I had courage. And it definitely was amazing to hear so many people tell me what they thought um, of that moment. And I'm so thankful for that. And um, I'm so thankful for teammates and staff that uh, shared how proud of me they were. Mm -hmm. And then complete strangers that also said, um, mm -hmm. you know, how inspired they were and proud of me that they were in that moment when they don't even know me um, as a person. So I think I was really protected by uh, that by the positivity and by the interview. And I think I look back on that and that was definitely supposed to happen. Um, and that was a big part of what got me through those, those next couple of days. And I will say that sometimes I think about that moment and it makes me want to throw up. Um, and then, you know, I snap out of it pretty quickly and I'm like, Did that, that was a long time ago. Everything's good. Everyone's for the most part over it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and the thing that I know is that the next time, I step up to take a penalty. I'm not going to miss. Love it. Love it. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you, you've experienced, here's the thing, and, and this, and I don't know if this is something, you know, you tell yourself, but when, you know, we go on air and we talk, it's everyone has had a moment in their career. It's athletes just have the spotlight on them. So take a hike, right? Keyboard warriors. Um, yeah. <laughs> We're totally on your side on that one. Completely I would also say, Janine, that not every athlete would stand up and do that interview. No and I, watching that myself as a reporter, um, you kind of have that moment where you think to yourself, like, is she going to talk? Because that's what you think after a game when you're covering a game. Like, 
is this person going to talk? And frankly, a lot of times when I cover sports, it's, is this man who's being um, paid $20 million and as part of his professional <laughs> obligation is talking to media, going to talk? And then it's like for an amateur, amateur by like, you know, um, like not necessarily the sort of professional environment athlete going to step up in that moment and like, and, and share. And I would say that in my experience, which is, I mean, I haven't been doing this for that long, but more often than not, they don't, or they lollygag about and they take forever. So to watch you actually stand up and have that courage as a, like a professional member of the media was the most incredible moment of the world cup for me. Um, just because I really do believe that not every athlete would have done that. And for you to step up and do that, it just shows your worth as a, as a leader. And I thought that that was pretty incredible, to be honest. Um, so I know that you did media and communications at school and you do your own media and, and, um, did you have any training? Do you like when you're, when you're sort of, um, sort of creating to like, sort of segue on to something else, like, do you try and sort of get yourself out there on your own with your vlog and, and with your social media and stuff? Do you see that as a tool for yourself? Yeah, well, thank you for the wonderful compliment. That's very nice of you. Um, <clears throat> we obviously go through some media training as athletes. Obviously, it's become quite an important thing uh, for teams to do for their athletes. Um, and obviously, you don't want to be the team that doesn't do the media training, and then something happens, and everyone's <laughs> like, that's your fault. Um, <laughs> It's, I'm obviously a very um, extroverted person. I, I love um, to communicate with people. I uh, have always been loud and um, <laughs> probably one of the loudest in the room uh, in my life. Definitely <laughs> the loudest in my family. Um, but I think with my choice to do media at school, I originally was a journalism major. And then I realized that I didn't really want to write. That wasn't really what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to do more of broadcast and, and media. So I switched to media strategies, which obviously is just more broad. Excuse me. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I did a, a sort of an internship with um, a girl that I'm still really close with at Tech, um, where I did some sideline reporting for the football team and some, I had a camera around at times. I helped her film some of her stuff. So that was kind of fun. But um, when I think about like inter doing interviews for myself, I just think of these like horrible interviews that I've watched. Where <laughs> I'm like, why would you ever say that? There's like massive <laughs> do's and don'ts when it, like just logical massive do's and don'ts um, when it comes to post-game interviews, anything like that. And it really irks me with team sports when, you know, say for example, I had made that penalty. I probably would have gotten interviewed after the game and it just drives me nuts how like obviously the media is going to focus on that penalty and I'm aware of that and I think that's probably where I differ from other people because I have literal educated knowledge about <laughs> what a media professional is looking to talk about in those moments mm -hmm. and like logically in that moment you would think as like any kind of person would know um but it just really makes me mad when people just totally turn the story on on themselves and like, oh, yeah, this is like the best moment of my life. I've been training my whole life for this. And I'm like, you also have 22 other people that <laughs> you could also have done that. So, um, and, and again, that's kind of just how I was raised. But um, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful for the media experience that I've had because it's definitely helped me uh not say things that I shouldn't say in the media uh but I think again our team is just good people mm -hmm. so I don't worry about anyone on our team saying something that they shouldn't for the most part yeah no no honestly the the group is such they're such great ambassadors and like you said there's no amount of training that can sort of prepare you for those crazy moments right like uh it's emotional you we do things that are odd under extreme yeah. pressure uh, so you definitely held your own but you know it's all about personal branding right so you have your your vlog <laughs> I guess mm -hmm. that's I don't I'm not you said it right some people say blog and I'm like no oh. it's a video vlog so vlog. Um, 
I'm learning myself here, you know, personal branding, you have your camps going. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the, that journey. And like, it, it's not, you know, not every player is taking those steps and, you know, you're putting yourself out there. It makes people feel closer to you um, yeah. as an athlete. And so tell us a little bit about that journey, about your camps and what you're looking to do with your personal brand, your platform. Yeah. So the idea around the blog, um, and now I also have a podcast that's kind of associated with my blog. So that started, um, oh my gosh, that would be just under a year ago that um, I really kind of got going on that. And that came from, um, I was working with a company called J1S and they're a marketing and brand company that one of my best friends um, is close friends with, with the guy that started, his name is Mike Jones. And um, <clears throat> my friend kind of approached me about this and said, we think it would be really cool to sign you as our first retainer athlete. So this is a relatively Ooh. new company. Um, they had never signed an athlete specifically to work with them. They were more of like an outsource um, marketing and, and branding company. And so I was like, totally um, let me know, you know, what your idea is. And so I have to give them credit for um, kind of, pushing me to, to build my brand a little bit. And, um, that's when I, I thought to myself, what do I like to see in other athletes? Um, and <laughs> part of me is like, when I film things, I'm like, this feels so boring to me. But that's <laughs> exactly what people want to see. It is. And mm -hmm. so I've learned so much about just like content and that you mm -hmm. don't have to try so hard to create yeah. content. Like people just literally want to see what you're doing. <laughs> like, how do you recover? What do you have for breakfast? It's like all these things that as an athlete, you don't ever really think about, but all these, um, you know, sports fans mm. are interested in. So um, with the vlog, my first idea was to kind of do uh, what, what a travel day looks like. Um, and so I ended up, the first one I ended up doing was obviously our champions league travel to Switzerland, which ended up casual, being the perfect first vlog because <laughs> there's literally no prettier place on earth than where we were, which was insane. So that was really yeah. cool. First thing. And, um, also Manchester city has been incredible with me, um, help like working with me on the vlog. Uh, so we've kind of tag teamed that a little bit and uh, we have some ideas for hopefully when the season continues to, to keep doing that. Um, I just think it's really important. Like I, everyone's like, you probably have like no free time and I actually have more free time than people probably think I do. <laughs> um, so I wanted to do something with it, um, mm -hmm. and take advantage. And it's also for me too. Like I get to document these awesome moments that I'm living. Um, and so that's been really cool. And then the podcast has been really fun too because I have access to to people that a lot of others don't. Um, exactly. I actually just recorded yesterday my first podcast of a new segment called Hashtag Teammates that I'm doing. So um, I just recorded with Rebecca Quinn. So that's going to come out um, hopefully by the end of the week or early next week. So that was really fun. More of like a fun segment. Um, Did she talk about her plants? or he was wearing a shirt it. that said plants are for everyone got it <laughs> so, yeah. does she have a green thumb like what are, what are we missing here does she have a green thumb she loves plants loves she, them she loves them she, she loves, loves them, them. um loves them. Their own. happy yeah. Earth day right yeah happy earth day oh my gosh we were doing a workout this morning on zoom together I should have told her happy earth day um so yeah that's kind of the the thing around the blog and then i also think like brands are super interested mm -hmm. in using that kind of uh platform so selfishly obviously you know that's why well, i need to build my own personal brand mm -hmm. um and and companies are looking for that kind of thing so that's been exactly. really cool too i uh, partnered with a axe throwing place in manchester to film <laughs> one of my vlogs and they uh said that they would love to host the team for like a team yeah. outing so it's just these awesome perfect partnerships and also awesome relationships from a human standpoint that you can build through um this it's just so multifaceted i love it how is this axe throwing safe now this is speaking from someone who's never done it but i fear for your lives we're gonna do a one soccer team building event at axe throwing and we'll teach what if, you balls out of my hand i will well, say okay. that it is a team building exercise more than you think it would be with teams we did uh, archery, knife throwing, and axe throwing is a team building exercise before the World Cup. 
So uh, no one was harmed in the team building exercise, <laughs> just so everyone knows. That's Hopefully me. that was okay to be public information. Um, <laughs> But they, I mean, they have obviously precautions, but I have seen horror videos of like when the axe drops on the ground and then it like bounces back at people. Um, well, not knock on wood, it. that doesn't happen yeah. a lot. Um, I don't, you know, not to toot my own horn, but <laughs> I did win, I did win the axe throwing championship of the day. Both times that I went to this place, they let you throw two axes at different targets Whoa. when you, um, when you get uh, to the elite level. So uh, I was able to do that, which was pretty cool, but it's definitely, you have to do it. It's so much fun. Oh, so you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're a Viking now. Basically. You're a Viking. You're a Viking now. I've yeah. found my true calling. <laughs> <laughs> Just before we move on, Janine, uh, to another round of rapid fire, get ready. Um, we do Ooh. have a question on YouTube from, from the Black Hole, and they wanted to ask you about your um, charitable and community work. They said you work with your brother, on oh, I forgot to mention the camp. Yeah. Like what? Um, why? Why? What's your intention behind that? Why do you like to do stuff like that? So um, I have to give my brother credit for the camp idea because that's something that he's wanted to do for a few years now, um, and he's super, super passionate about it. And he worked so hard to make the camp um, a reality. It's really difficult to plan a camp when you got one person living in the U.S. and one person living <laughs> in the U.K. It is. Um, so we decided we wanted to do our camp called the Proving Ground Academy um, at Christmas time at the beginning of 2019. So mm -hmm. also, no idea. I had no idea what goes into planning a camp. It is insanely hard. Yes. Um, and I didn't even do like a quarter of the work. So my brother's a saint. Um, but for us, like as a family, when we were young, uh, we all grew up playing for the same youth club here in Colorado. And um, when our dad passed away when I was young, the club stepped up big time um, and just became like a second family for us and gave us so much. We None of us would be the people that we are. My brother and I would not be the players that we are if it wasn't for Real Colorado. And um, I think the biggest motivation behind my brother and I wanted to do a campus just to give back to the community that gave us so much when we were young. And that's so cliche to say, but um, mm -hmm. it's really amazing to see how people appreciate that and how things come so full circle. Uh, so we actually did the camp here in Colorado. We had a lot of kids from, from the youth um, club that we played for. And we were originally gonna charge for the camp, which is also difficult because camps are expensive and yeah. That's just the reality of it. And so when we originally opened the camp up, we didn't have a ton of interest. It's also, it was a hard time of the year because I'm only home for a certain time of the year and he's only home for a certain time of the year. So we only really had that window to do it. Excuse me. And yeah, so we had, I think, less than 10 signups. And my brother's like, why are we even charging for this? Like, let's just do it for free. Mm -hmm. So he changed we changed our minds and we ended up getting, um, I think there was just under 80 kids total at the camp, which was, it was so great. It was three days that were absolutely exhausting, but it was so much fun. And we got so many messages after the camp, just how much people enjoyed it and how thankful that they were that we did this. And it, that's, it makes it all worth it. Um, I think it slept for like 15 hours then last night of the, <laughs> of the camp, but it's definitely something that we want to continue to do. We want to make it an annual thing. Um, so Obviously, this situation's kind of throwing a wrench in everyone's plans. Oh, yeah. We'll see what happens. But um, giving back and, and community are massive to me. Uh, I want to, I've had an idea for a few years to start a nonprofit. So um, fingers crossed that I can get that off the ground, hopefully in the next couple of years. Um, but I just think it's, it's our duty as athletes at um, the top level to use our platforms and I think it's a waste of a platform if you're not using it to do some kind of good because we get to kick a ball around the field for a living. And um, that's we're pretty lucky to be able to do that. So I think the least that we can do is, is do something uh, for other people. And you see someone like uh, Ashley Lawrence, who has done her Yes, She Canada um, event. Great. Yep, yep. And she's <laughs> just done such a good job with that and obviously sync with um, all of her mm. work for... Um, the medical community has been incredible. So I think uh, it's just part of our responsibility as athletes. Well said. Let's have a little bit more fun again, shall we? All right, let's do it.
get to know you two a little bit more. Uh, so same deal. I go first, then Carm will ask, and okay. then Laura will ask. All right. Uh, what's, a, what's a workout you can't live without? Doesn't necessarily need to be in self-isolation. Maybe there's just a particular workout that you love that you can't live without. I think if I had to, if I could never run again, I would be like, so I love to run. Um, I, I weirdly like interval workouts. Like I hate them while I'm doing them, but that, it's just like the best feeling when you're done, you feel so accomplished. And yeah. uh, Carm will know that a, a hit workout prescribed by uh, Caesar is no thing to shake your finger at. So um, uh, no as much as it's like the worst thing in the world while you're doing it, uh, it they work. Yeah, I love those types of workouts too. Very true. By the way, just a side note, when I was speaking to Christine St. Clair earlier this week, she said she hates running, which is why she's such a good lurker up front. She takes her spot. And I was like, do you play soccer? And she runs so much. I know. Like, no, no, I like. I pick my spots. I don't like. I'm like, well, there you go. Maybe that's Maybe that's what makes you feel so much more relate, uh, like relate to her so much. Yeah, I'm like, oh, I'm like, yeah same. There you go. All right, so she scores so many goals in her career because yeah. she saves herself. Yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. it's, I'm just kidding. Listen, <laughs> center back here. So I definitely don't agree with you there, but all good. <laughs> definitely pick the position that, yeah. All right. So next one, go to quarantine meal. What do you whip up when they're, you know, when you're feeling kind of lazy? Mm. I love to cook. Love, oh. love, love to cook. Um, and I uh, have a really nice kitchen in the UK. So I do a lot of cooking in the mm. UK and my sister and my mom are benefiting from my joy of cooking right now. Um, <laughs> since I lived in the UK, I've learned how to make a very good curry. So, um, mm. we've had curry and homemade non bread a few times since I've been. Oh so my God. I was expecting that is my favorite. Can Definitely my go-to. You? If you yeah. could, if you could only mail food, I've, I would just, I would, <laughs> ha I would be able to stop playing because I could just make a living off of mailing people food. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know where we want to go for a, for a good meal. I remember like when I was in England one time, because I was told that's what you have to go. Yes. Exceptional Indian food. And I, I was on my own. I was doing my own little touring through, uh, through Europe when I was younger and I slurped up that Indian food. Like I, everyone was looking at me. Like I was the crazy tourist that walked it's in. It's the on. yummiest <laughs> thing on earth. So good. So good. Now this thing about not being around other people is over curry night. Yes. yes. Let's do it. I'm in. Massive. I remember right. going to an Done. Indian restaurant in England where I walked in and they like literally had to pull the table off the wall. It was so small so that I could like sit at the table and I was like, did I make a mistake here? Best nope. Thing I've ever had in my yep. life. Yep. It was, it was so good. Nice. Uh, now I'm hungry. So that's yeah. perfect. Um, live you. sport you're missing other than soccer. It absolutely broke my heart when the NCAA canceled the men's basketball yeah. tournament. Yeah. I actually could have cried. So college basketball. college basketball. Do you put together brackets? Do you have that? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, my team went to the national championship last year. Right. Okay. Yes. The Red Raiders of good old Texas Tech oh, made woo. that run. And then, you know those, yeah. you have your team, and in one of your brackets, you put them all the way to the final because you just have to do that because yeah, they're you your team. To. And the other yeah. bracket's like, okay, this is the one I'm banking on. My team went all the way to the final. So I was <laughs> loving life. Nice. Okay. All right. So, and all right. So March Madness. I can, I can yep. see that. That would hurt. Yeah, That's definitely a big tournament. Um, what is a home? Okay. So you love cooking. But is there a home project here or anything maybe that you want to do while you're self-isolating? What I don't know if you carpentry, learn a little language. I don't know. What is it? Um, I told myself I was going to read more. Haven't. It's been a month. <laughs> um, my sister and I decided to do a 2,000 piece puzzle. Oh, so let's just oh, give you a little showing of oh, the puzzle. Oh, the whole table. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a table that sits eight people and the puzzle is covering the entire table I'm so, so it's jealous. the most infuriating yet the most accomplished feeling thing that i've done this entire quarantine what is it supposed to look like it's a farm uh, <laughs> of all things it's a picture of a farm oh that's oh, not okay. basic though that's pretty pretty beautiful it's just like this tree is the same as this tree <laughs> but they're on different sides oh, so you take on. one piece and you're like oh 
oh, oh, and then oh, I hate that. 20 minutes later, you've not gotten one piece. <laughs> Why did you start this puzzle? I know. Uh, <laughs> early last week. Okay. Okay. To be fair, we haven't consistently been working on it. It's some days I'm like, I just can't. Uh, but oh, it's been good. So good. All right. Okay. That is good. All right. So that ends the rapid fire uh, section of Zoom. We have time always flies by. We have like four minutes. Um, I know four minutes left with you. So I do want to get this in, right? Because of course, the Summer Olympics postponed for a year. Um, so I guess, you know, A, your, your reaction to that. And it's kind of chronological because you qualify. So there's mm -hmm. complete elation. Mm -hmm. Then the Canadian Olympic Committee you know, takes a stand and says, these are happening this summer, we're not going to be there, which means if it goes ahead, you're not going, you don't have a chance mm -hmm. to come back, you know, get on the podium again. Uh, but then what was your reaction when you found out the games were in fact postponed? I feel like there's, and then you also found out that your qualification spots are going to be honored. What yeah. was that roller coaster ride of emotions like? Completely round circle. Um, so obviously like the qualifying tournament was just, so great for us um with sync breaking the record and then um us qualifying it was obviously uh, a great thing to be a part of and then all this happens and um everything starts to be canceled and postponed and this is like the biggest sporting event ever and mm -hmm. you're th i'm thinking to myself there's no way they're gonna there's no way they're gonna cancel it because mm -hmm. that was my first fear is this is not gonna happen ever um, and then I'm thinking they can't postpone it because obviously there's like other things going on in the world. Anyway, so I was, all these questions. And then uh, Team Canada announces that they're not sending athletes. And it was like this complete kind of um, bittersweet emotion for me because I was so proud uh, to be a Team Canada athlete and to, for them to be the first nation to stand up and say we're protecting our athletes. Um, yeah. You know, and we're not gonna do this. And so I felt so much pride in that and that was definitely a shared feeling around the team uh but also just yeah the disappointment in knowing that wow this could happen and, and we won't be there uh but i had a strong feeling that you know other countries were gonna stand with us and say that they weren't gonna send athletes either and and that's obviously the power of sport and the power yeah. of um you know stepping up like that so i was i think 90 percent just like super proud and happy um to be a canadian athlete as i always am um, and then when that happened, I think I kind of made the decision, there's just no way this is going to happen with everything changing so fast. And so I felt like I was kind of prepared for it to be postponed. Um, so when it, when the news actually came out, I was kind of like, okay, well, they finally made the decision. Um, and for me, because I'm kind of in the middle of the, the pack in terms of my age, mm -hmm. it was like, I'm still going to be playing in a year. So yes. I had no plans to not continue to be playing next year. So for me, it didn't really affect me like that. We haven't had a chance to really speak about it as a team much. Um, but I know that some of the older players are probably affected a little bit more by that. Yeah. Um, and I feel for them. Uh, and I hope that for all of Canada that they continue to, to push for the next year and that we can have them on board next summer um, and, and push for that gold. But I'm excited to, for another year to get better. And uh, to have a full year to prepare knowing that we've already uh, qualified is going to be, I think, something that we can really take advantage of. Absolutely love that attitude. Janine, uh, it was a pleasure having you on today. The pleasure was all mine, ladies. Yes. <laughs> Cheers here. If anyone tuned in halfway through or near Cheers. the end, uh, don't worry. You can head on over to the One Soccer YouTube channel. You can watch this in its entirety. It's going to get posted. We also have some other great content there. We have hangouts with uh, CPL players as well as other national team players. Gareth Wheeler sits down with a lot of great guests. We have a ton of great soccer content for you on the One Soccer YouTube channel. That's it for us today. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.